quick shout out to A, Patrick Forter, um, who's the one who came up with Souci n'est pas un virus, a uh, good colleague of mine who's in Paris, but he's pushing this first German phage therapy meeting, so October of this year. Um, go check it out, uh, find out all about the really fascinating things that are going on with phage therapy. Today, we're going to finally talk about some of these you know, fun viruses, particularly this one up at the top here, if I can get my pointer to work. Uh, the STIV virus, and I've brought lots and lots of props with me um, in order to hopefully help out in terms of understanding the vagarities of icosahedral symmetry and the wonders of triangulation numbers. But first, wanted to quickly review what we talked about last time. Yes, it was a whole weekend ago on Friday. Can't remember any of this stuff. Um, Poisson distribution, why do we care about the Poisson distribution? So basically, knowing how many cells are infected, but why is that important? So determine growth, but also if you're trying to set up a particular kind of experiment, what would that be? One-step growth curves, particularly important for that. And just thinking about populations and single particles. So a cell is a single particle, a virus is a single particle, and just randomly how those are going to interact with each other. Uh, virus replication, basically put this up because we're going to be talking about all of these different stages for the different viruses as we move on through the rest of the course. What's the key to Baltimore? classification? The two real keys to the Baltimore classification. Yeah, Stephen said we didn't have to remember what numbers they are, so why do we bother? The nucleic acids that are being packaged in the virion, yes, that's one, but that doesn't tell you all the differences. It's the other one. Strand orientation is also an important differentiation. So RNA intermediates, what particular kind of RNA? It's making that messenger RNA. So it's how you make the messenger RNA, which is probably that's the central point about thinking about all of these things. Because, and why is messenger RNA so important? Proteins, yes, because that's how you make proteins. What do so far no viruses encode? Protein what? Ribosomes, exactly. So uh, one of the things I read over the weekend I probably shouldn't have is this new method. I was thinking about putting the reference up here uh, from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences talking about science education. And basically they said the more silence you hear in a lecture, that means there's more active learning going on, and that's a good thing. We shall see how well that works. Uh, <clears throat> and then last time we talked a little bit about the methods for determining virus structures. Basically, with the exception of the absolutely largest virions, you have to have an electron microscope in order to be able to visualize virions. And you can do the quick and dirty technique, which is the negative stain, which is what we do all the time. If you want to get higher resolution structures, you can use cryo-electron microscopy, which I wonder where did I put my little um, version here of your near cryo-electron microscope. So our, our favorite virus, the SSV1 virus, we solve the structure by cryo-electron microscopy, which is taking lots and lots of pictures and averaging them all together. And that can give you almost molecular resolution if you get really, really lucky. And if you're talking about individual virus proteins, I've got a couple of 3D models of them up here. Take a look at them later. Um, that comes from X-ray crystallography, and X-ray crystallography allows you to get, if you've got a good crystal, uh, to literally atomic resolution on some of these structures. And as a nice example of this, this is actually a cryo-electron microscopy reconstruction of a virus that, you know, who cares about this particular virus? Actually, nobody did care about this particular virus until about two years ago. Um, but since then, there's been a massive number of publications on it. Um, this is a cryo-electron reconstruction. And so each of these, it's probably a little bit hard to see here, the 
thin black lines around each of these individual virions is what the computer has selected for one of those particles to average. And then in this case, it was about 30,000 of these that were averaged together in order to get um, this structure. And in fact, this structure was so good that they could even assign some of the amino acids. So again, pretty close to atomic resolution here. If you look at this tyrosine side chain here, um, fits nicely to electron density. Unfortunately, this glutamate over here doesn't fit quite so well. So it's, it's pretty close. And really, the cryo-electron microscopy is, is very much the way to go. And we've learned a lot from looking at these kinds of structures. So what are we going to talk about for the rest of lecture today? Um, this is also a cryo-electron microscopy reconstruction. Uh, particularly about this whole concept of quasi-symmetry. Um, quasi-symmetry is something that needs to be invoked in order to go from a regular icosahedron, which just has triangular faces with five-fold symmetric subunits to it, to a larger structure. And basically all that is is taking something that's either a pentamer, so has five of the individual subunits, and kind of blowing up a little bit, adding one more extra subunit to it. And that's exactly how soccer balls are put together. You've got five-fold symmetry and six-fold symmetry that's associated with them. So one of the ways to think about that is the so-called triangulation number. Uh, and this is a right, great way of characterizing how virus structures come together. And we're going to talk a lot about T numbers, give some examples of that, and then talk about some assembly and envelopes. We know a lot less about envelopes and assembly than these nice icosahedral structures here. And then um, I will read from page one of this text. No, that's not quite true. But we'll talk a little bit about virus taxonomy, um, which this is, in fact, the older version. I think this one with how many pages do we have in here? Yeah, a little about 1,300 pages is ridiculously out of date. Um, so we're, we're working on some of that. So some of the, the key concepts here, again, um, structure is the acosahedral symmetry, but moving beyond the classic icosahedron and starting to think about quasi-symmetry and T-numbers. Budding, which we talked a little bit about here before, but we'll talk a little bit more about, particularly for enveloped viruses. This is how viruses get their envelopes. And it's a really pretty unique process. So like the virion is a pretty unique aspect of virus replication. The budding aspect where you end up with a membrane around your genome, also a very virus-specific process. And then we'll talk a little bit about assembly. We talked about this a little bit last time. We talked about the virus capsid paradox. Anybody remember what the virus capsid paradox was? No, it was Friday. <laughs> flexible and the opposite of flexible. Yeah, that's good. Yep. Yes, exactly. So you want to be able to have a stable, or in fact, many cases, metastable um, state when you're as a virion on the outside of the cell. But as soon as you infect, you've got to release the genome, which is on the inside of that virion. So in that case, it has to be less stable. And so we'll talk about some of the processes and how that happens. Um, the taxonomy, no, I'm not going to read the whole book. Uh, the main thing here really has to do with the genome and the various different genomes. And so we talked about that when we talked about the Baltimore classification already. That's more of a classification in terms of a taxonomy uh, that is just giving them names. Yes, we're humans. We like to put names on things. Biology is biology. And so how you classify these things starts to be much more confusing. Uh, a lot has to do with what hosts are being infected by these particular viruses. And then the latest thing in taxonomy is talking about metagenomes, all those little green spots that we had in lecture one. So this is the same slide that I showed last time, or PowerPoint thing, image, slide. How many of you know slides? What's a slide? Yeah, little glass stuff, you know, negatives, all that stuff. Slides. I used to carry them around with me when I went to talks. So it was a real pain. Um, so, <laughs> so this PowerPoint image, um, where <clears throat> we talked about the 
real problem with, and I didn't bring my DNA model this time, uh, nucleic acids versus amino acids. Three nucleotides take up a lot of space for any individual amino acid. So for most viruses with relatively small genomes, economy, you know, keep it simple, stupid, is a really nice way to go. And one of the best ways to do that is to have your capsid proteins interacting with all of the other capsid proteins in as identical a process as possible. And so the probably best example of that is when you have a helical structure where this subunit interacts with that subunit just the same way as that subunit interacts with this subunit and all of the other ones around them. In this helical structure, all of these interactions are actually identical to each other. Problem with these helical structures is what happens when you get to an end because this is a <clears throat> part which can be degraded relatively easily. Um, another problem, remember double-stranded DNA breaks from last term, you know, molecular biology. Um, anytime you have an end, um, that's a serious problem. One way to deal with ends, of course, is to have something which is circular. If you're thinking about genomes, the three-dimensional equivalent of that is to have a sphere or something approximating a sphere. So icosahedral symmetry is another way to solve basically the same problem. And we talked a little bit about the icosahedral symmetry before, but I wanted to spend some more time talking about it today. Um, and the whole idea of icosahedral symmetry really is just geometry, pretty standard basic geometry. And if you just think about the <clears throat> different kinds of shapes that you can use, a regular shape to make a particular volume. One of those, probably the easiest one, tetrahedron, just four triangular sides. Um, that works great, except it's too small to put much anything into. If you just think about the size of a standard protein and your standard nucleic acid that you would need to code for that protein. A cube, just squares on the side. It's actually relatively easy to make squares. But again, that's too small. So the next step up, five-sided. Um, this would be a <clears throat> icosahedron. Well, actually, not quite an icosahedron. This would be your um, five-sided. Uh, but that process gets you to just about where you need to be in order to have enough space on the inside and few enough interactions on the outside. So again, to get these, you've got these five-fold rotational axes, which is nicely drawn as my pentagons here um, around the outside of the soccer ball. Yes, you can count 12 of them if you like. Uh, <clears throat> and then various three-fold and two-fold axes. What you end up with is a what's also called a T equals 1 icosahedron here. But now each of these subunits, again, drawn with these little commas, is interacting with all of its neighbors in the same way, at least at this end. Here, this guy's interacting with four other neighbors. This guy's interacting with four other neighbors. These guys are interacting with four other neighbors as well. Yeah? Would it be a good idea to remember just how many rotation axes the icosahedral symmetry has? Would it be a good idea to remember these things? Is it going to be on the exam? Um, is another yeah. way of putting this question. <laughs> I'm trying um, to be diplomatic. <laughs> sometimes I can see through you. Know, so. um, yeah, no, I would certainly, um, well, well, there'll be lots of numbers as far as these things. And so anything that I talk about multiple times in lecture is probably going to be really fair game in terms of, of exams. But I do think it's useful in my twisted thinking um, here to, to think about that. Because if you think about the 12 five-fold axes of symmetry, so if you've got five subunits around each of those 12 axes, multiply five by 12, what do you get? 60. How many subunits do you think you have in a regular icosahedral capsid structure? Probably 60. Not just probably 60, but exactly 60. <laughs> Um, and that is going to also be a very useful number to remember. So um, 60 capsid protein subunits in that regular 
completely regular icosahedral structure. Now, one thing that I always keep forgetting to remind myself to say is that an icosahedron is literally those 60 subunits and only five-fold axes associating with each other. This model and this model and the ginormous Mimi virus capsid have icosahedral symmetry. They're not regular icosahedrons because they have extra subunits in each of those. They're much more than 60, particularly in the case of, of Mimi virus. But they still have the icosahedral symmetry. And that's getting back to your question about the 12 five-fold axes of symmetry and 32-fold and 3-folds. So it's just, that's just a rotational axis. You get back the same thing when you rotate around each of those axes. Um, and there's this really nice website here, which I've linked to, to look at lots of icosahedral virus structures um, and just icosahedral, say icosahedrally symmetric, can I keep naming that? Icosahedrally symmetric virus structures. Um, this Viper database at the Scripps Research Institute is a really nice way of looking at the thing, these things. In the past, I've asked students to make icosahedrally symmetric virus particles. Um, this is a great place to find that. I don't do that anymore because I had just a ridiculous number of icosahedrally symmetric virus particles. Uh, but it's a great way of thinking about and really visualizing what a lot of this stuff looks like. So if you're having any kind of trouble wrapping your brain around this, um, I strongly recommend going and taking a look um, at that website. So let's look at some examples. Um, here is probably one of the simplest virions. This is Calpi mosaic virus. I don't expect you to remember that. Um, but this has a T equals 1 structure. This is an icosahedron. And it's a little hard to see, or maybe turn the lights completely down. Uh, here is one of those five-fold axes of symmetry. These extra gold blobs are just stuck here around the outside. There are three of these identical capsid protein subunits here, one in red, one in blue, and one in green. Each of these comes together as a triangular face. This guy down here, this green one will interact with five other green ones. This red one's going to interact with five other red ones. And all of these are now going to fit together into one of these um, completely symmetrical structures. And just the particles are just an easy way of, of looking at that. If you were to count each of those gold particles, how many would you expect to see? Exactly. Good, we're learning. Um, so <clears throat> the problem is, is that that structure, um, Calpi, excuse me, back up real quickly. Um, Calpi mosaic virus has a tiny genome. It's only about two and a half thousand base pairs, actually bases, it's a single-stranded RNA virus. So that can just barely fit in there. Most virions um, have to encapsulate a much larger nucleic acid genome. So a couple of smart guys, Casper and Klug, and anyone know German? Klug is smart in German, so, you know, not a coincidence, but be that as it may. Um, these are mathematicians who started thinking about virus structures, say virion structures, and came up with this, I think, really kind of revolutionary idea of quasi-equivalence. Of course, all they could have done is just you know, gone down to the local soccer pitch and you know, found one of these things. And basically what they said is with just a very little bit of tweaking with these subunits, we can now put six of them together instead of just having five of them together. And in that process, actually use exactly the same protein but have it interacting in a very slightly different way. And that's the quasi-equivalence. If you have completely equivalent structures, you're going to have an icosahedron, all these guys interacting with each other identically. Quasi-equivalence, stretch that a little bit. And all it is is putting in these hexameric units between your pentameric units. And this is a great, wonderful idea. Works really nicely. The 
question is, how do you have a relatively good shorthand for thinking about how to do this? Because it turns out you can fit these six-fold axes of symmetry really easily between five-fold axes of symmetry, like you do with a soccer ball right here. Or you can fit them in in slightly different ways. And it turns out there's lots of different ways that you can put hexagons between pentagons and end up with a closed structure. And in fact, that's all Casper and Kluge were talking about. Anytime you have a pattern of hexagons, all you need to do is add 12 pentagons to that, and you can end up with a closed structure. And so that's what all the mathematics is about. Now, getting back to your Ian's question about the 12s again. Um, so 12 pentagons in an array of hexagons can give you a closed structure. If you have icosahedral symmetry, that gives you something which you can then define mathematically. We could go through the whole mathematical derivation. I don't expect you to do that. If you're interested, you can go and look at the field textbook. Uh, but basically, what this is, is it gives you it's called a triangulation number. h squared plus hk plus k squared. Huh. What the heck are h and k? h and k are just two vectors that you can think about on the surface of one of these icosahedrally symmetric structures. So the easiest case is at equals 1, where literally all you're doing is hopping from one five-fold axis to the next five-fold axis of symmetry. So how many hops do you have to take between this five-fold axis and that five-fold axis? One. And that's in one direction. So your h is going to be 1. Your k is going to be 0. h squared plus h squared. H squared plus HK plus K squared is going to be equal to what? 1. Okay, so let's expand that a little bit. Start thinking about some of the harder math. Uh, by the way, I would expect you to know this equation, by the way. Uh, now, in this case, we've put a hexamer, probably the easiest place to look at is right here, a hexamer between two of these five-fold axes of symmetry. So now, to get from five-fold axis to five-fold axis, we have to go one, two. Still on one axis. You haven't changed direction yet, right? So that'll be h is going to be equal to two. So what would the triangulation number of this icosahedrally symmetric particle be? Two squared. So two squared plus two times zero plus zero squared. Okay, so this is a t equals 4 icosahedron. And just by saying you have a t equals 4 icosahedrally symmetric structure tells you exactly where each of these hexameric subunits happen to be. Okay, now let's start getting a little crazy. Um, this one, five-fold axis of symmetry, five-fold axis of symmetry. To get from one to the next, the shortest distance, you go one, and then, uh-oh, we change directions and go one more. So that means h is 1 and k is 1. So h squared plus hk plus k squared gives you what? t equals 3. So this is a t equals 3 icosahedron here. This is a t equals 12 icosahedron based on the individual subunits. You can come take a look at it later. Um, it's 1, 2, 1, 2. So H is 2, K is 2. Let's look at a real example. Calpi chlorotic model virus. Again, I don't expect you to remember these terms here. Um, this is a really nice T equals 3 virus particle. Start here at a five-fold axis. So basically what you're looking for are pentamers, anything that's got five sides to it. And that's going to be each of the corners, literally if you want to think about it from an icosahedral symmetric structure. And then it's got a nice six-fold right here in between. It's the same capsid protein, actually identical capsid protein, arranged in a quasi-equivalent structure. So here we've got H is 1, K is 1, T equals 3, virus particle. Okay, what about this one? 
So um, this guy, and we'll talk about the capsid proteins that go together to do this um, toward the end of the lecture today. Uh, this is a virus that, or say, that I found the virion for, um, a sample from Yellowstone National Park, right back to one of the first ones we look at. Very first known icosahedral, the symmetric virus that it equals 31 structure. How the heck do you get to 31? Well, it's a lot easier to do over on this side. If I can get my pointer back. Oops. Don't, no clicker questions yet. Um, <laughs> so here's a five-fold axis of symmetry. Here's another five-fold axis of symmetry. How do you get from this one to that one? You have to count one, two, three, four, five. H is five. K is one. So five squared plus five times one plus one squared gives you 31. Um, curious enough, this was the first one ever found that had this particular kind of structure um, to it. Now, this is a slight you know, oversimplification. Um, turns out that the structures here at the five-fold axis of symmetry, which are really beautiful, these you know, sort of knobs that stick out here, and you can tell they're five-fold symmetric. Just look at the five-fold dots on here. The six-folds in between are a little harder to see. I will be the first one to admit that. Uh, but these are clearly different proteins than the ones that are here in between them. And so this is what people call a pseudo T equals 31 structure because they're actually different proteins. So this should really be a P T equals 31. But the way those are arranged, you can tell, you know, anyone says T equals 31, it's going to have a structure which is, is just like this. So now we're all happy with T numbers. Yes, no, not, yes. Well, I was wondering, do individual variants in each family, would, would they have a common triangulation number if they're in the common family? So the, the question here actually has a little bit to do with virus taxonomy that we'll get back to <laughs> a little bit later on. Um, has to do with viruses in the same family. Are they going to have the same kind of triangulation numbers in terms of their icosahedral capsids? That depends a lot on your virus family and what you're talking about. But in general, similar viruses are going to have very similar triangulation numbers to each other. OK, so now we're all ready. If you didn't print out the notes, I strongly suggest that you find someone who did um, next to you or nearby, because I printed this out without the questions on the side here. Um, so what is the T number of the virion on, well, in this case, on the right? Um, on the left here is the other way. So um, <clears throat> this is 1, 3, 7, 25, or 31. Again, feel free to chat about this. Hopefully I'll find someone who's got, and it's hard to see up here if you don't have an actual image in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> Again, the key is to find the five-fold axes of symmetry. If you can find the five-folds, the rest of it should be pretty straightforward. Do you want to look at what people think, or do you want to go through and do it again? Do it again? Yes? Yes? Do it again? OK. Sure. That's what they said. No, PNAS said the longer downtime and more voices, the better. So let's start again. Hmm? Yeah. Should I turn the lights completely off, or would that help? <laughs> 
Maybe one more. Better, worse, better. Ten. Three, two. <clears throat> okay, so um, again, the key here is to find five-fold axes of symmetry. There is a nice five-fold axis of symmetry right here. If I could draw with this. Um, Here's another five-fold axis of symmetry over here. Here's one down here. Um, so we need to get from one of these five-folds to the next five-fold. So we jump from here. There's one, two in this direction. And we change directions and go back over here. So what does that give us? Two squared plus two times one plus one squared. Seven, yes. Now, how many of us thought that? Yes, woohoo! Okay, good. So this will be easy. Everyone will be happy with this, as long as I let everyone talk to each other during the exams. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I can't do that. So. Okay. So again, why am I spending so much time thinking and you know? talking about this stuff because just knowing a T number tells you a huge amount. Um, the other thing that I forgot to mention is that a really nice way of figuring out how many capsid protein subunits you have in any given icosahedron is you take the T number and you multiply it by 60. So a T equals 3 quasi-equivalent icosahedral virus structure was going to have how many capsid protein subunits? 180. So um, t equals 31. 31 times 60. No, I can't do that in my head. <laughs> um, yes, it's, it's exactly right. You can use that and then calculate the number of capsid protein subunits uh, that way. So that's, I would say, probably the majority of virions, particularly the larger virions, are going to have some variation of this icosahedrally symmetric um, kind of structure. Even some kind of bizarre ones. Um, phi 29 is one of my colleagues works on. It's not this kind of nice icosahedral structure. It's actually got an extra band of hexagonal subunits in between, just kind of a stretched icosahedron, also called a prolate icosahedron. That is, in fact, exactly what you have in bacteriophage T4, which is in fact one of the problems with this structure. The head should be a little bit stretched. But still, you have, getting back to Ian's question, you're still going to have 12 pantomers, but they're not going to be axes of symmetry because if you're going to rotate this around one of, say, this pentamers, you're not going to get that same structure back again. Uh, turns out that HIV-1, the nucleocapsid of HIV-1, is another modification of this structure. Turns out that one end has one kind of symmetry, the other hand has another kind of symmetry. We think that SSB1, we have a chance to talk about this later, is going to have two of these fused to each other in the middle. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that more later. Here's a nice T equals <clears throat> three icosahedrally symmetric kind of structure. And anyone know what this one in the middle is? <laughs> 
It's not Epcot, although Epcot is very similar. This is from Montreal and their um, <clears throat> expo that they had there. Yeah, Ian. Um, is the sort of more ovular uh, capsule structures that do accommodate a larger genome or anything? So the question is that these um, ovoid, and it's like people call them prolate icosahedron, is it to encapsidate a larger genome? The answer is probably yes. Um, now, why? Um, turns out that HIV-1 actually encodes a relatively small genome, but it's got this large structure like this, and we're trying to push it as being a new paradigm for virus structure. No one believes us yet, but um, we're working on it. Um, that it's, this is a, just a more generalized case of one of these closed three-dimensional structures by having 12 pentagons on it. And so the icosahedron is just a, or icosahedron symmetric, I should say, is just a very simplified version of that. But the more general state, and this is much more of a mathematical argument, is one where you just have 12 panamers arranged in various different functions, various different ways. Okay, so these are all the pretty picture versions. I also used to ask people to go and find images of these kinds of icosahedra, and so people would find something like this, or they found Epcot Center. Anyone's interested, go and look at Epcot Center, tell me what the T number is. Uh, actually, no, we went through that previously. But let's look at some much more interesting versions, much smaller, of course. Um, some real versions of these icosahedrally symmetric particles. Polio is a really nice example of a pseudo T equals three icosahedron because they're actually different proteins that come together in a quasi-equivalent kind of structure. Incredibly creatively named VP1, 2, and 3. Um, so <clears throat> these guys come together. Each of them basically has the same structure. Again, let me turn the lights down for this. Here, what's called a jelly roll beta barrel, and all that means is that the strands are just interleaving with each other and anti-parallel relative to each other, wrapping around in this particular structure. It may, may not look like a jelly roll, it's up to you. Uh, but each of these different subunits, VP1, VP2, and VP3, all have this jelly roll-like structure in the middle, and then extra bits and pieces um, hanging off around the outside, but each of them arranged in a nice T equals three quasi-equivalent process. T equals three times our favorite magic number. 60 gives us how many different subunits? 180, exactly. So this is a nice simple version. Uh, one of the reasons to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, use polio. Polio is one of the few viruses that we actually have an X-ray crystal structure for. And so we have the high, really high resolution structure, which actually is shown um, down here in the corner um, of that particular structure. Adenovirus, um, sort of the classic Sputnik-like virus. These guys are really easy to tell where the five-fold axes of symmetry are because they have these little spikes coming off of them. This spike here is a little harder to see, but getting from this spike to that spike, or this spike here to that spike there, this spike here um, to this spike here, again, it's a little harder to see that particular spike. You go one, two, three, four, five. Don't have to change any directions. What does that give you? T equals 25, H squared plus HK plus K squared. Um, so they're arranged in this fashion, 25 times 60 will give you the number of subunits that you have in this particular structure. Now, so five squared is what? 25, five times zero, and zero plus zero squared because you're not going any dire other direction at that point. If you're going five and then one, right, right. that would be a different story. That gives you what? STIV, you know, T equals 31. <laughs> so <clears throat> here, this is, as I mentioned before, we should have a pseudo 
T equals 25 because they're different proteins. Again, not surprisingly, just like STIV, um, this thing sticking out here is not the same as the proteins which are all together here. Conveniently, they call these penton proteins and hexon proteins. Those are the hexon for the hexameric subunits and the pentons for the pentameric subunits. And we'll talk a lot more when we talk about um, adenovirus when we talk about this um, later on. We're getting bigger and bigger and bigger now. Paramecium bursaria chlorella virus is an algal virus. It's an internal membrane. It's a pseudo P169 arrangement <laughs> of these capsid protein subunits. So still using exactly the same idea of hexameric subunits versus pentameric subunits, still just 12 pentamers and a whole bunch of hexamers in this case. And getting back to, I forget whose question it was, um, about bigger genomes, this one's 330,000 base pairs. So it's a pretty darn big genome. And even if you go to what used to be the largest virus, I know I'm out of date here, um, Mimi virus, <clears throat> the, is it amoeba, acanthamoeba, I forget what the P is for. Um, Mimi, uh, Mimi virus, um, T equals 1,179, but still icosahedrally arranged um, in terms of all these. And you can just do the, the math, I did it for you. Um, 70,740 capsid proteins, no I don't expect you to remember that number. Um, but arranged in these um, quasi-equivalent structures. So. This is, is great. It's a really wonderful way of, of thinking about each of these individual icosahedral structures. But of course, this is biology. So what does that mean? There are always going to be exceptions as far as is concerned. So SV40, simian virus 40, uh, Popova virus, we're going to talk a lot more about SV40. It was a really early model system for studying DNA viruses. Um, has only one coat protein. and Looks like it should be arranged in a perfectly normal quasi-equivalent fashion. Um, the only problem is, if you look at the number of subunits that make up any individual virion, it's 360. I challenge any of you to come up with a nice equation that gives you a T equals 6 structure. Unless we're talking about partial hops. But again, this is kind of like the Poisson distribution. We're talking about single hops. So what the heck is going on here? Fortunately, again, this is one of the viruses for which we have a X-ray crystal structure. And what people found there, when they looked at the structure, is that instead of having hexameric symmetry, where you should have hexamers, again, like you have here in your soccer ball, has pentamers. So somehow, evolutionarily, this single protein is able to form multiple different interactions with each other. Each of these differently colored ones here, it's the same protein, is interacting with its neighbors in a slightly different way. And this was one of the first examples that I know of where you can have one protein with six different structures in its normal function, which is kind of bizarre. Everything, hopefully, we learned about when we talked about protein structures. One amino acid sequence, one structure. No, one amino acid, six different structures. Very, very, very bizarre. But again, it's biology. Um, interestingly enough, it also has a beta barrel structure to it. These beta barrels seem to be very well conserved in evolution in terms of putting together capsid protein structures. Um, and we'll look again at some of these in about 10 minutes or so here, um, some of these different beta barrel-like structures that come together. So that was one of the first like, really bizarre exceptions. And again, it's these exceptions which are proving the rule, um, but having these one amino acid sequence, six different structures um, relative to each other. Another big surprise was found when, again, an X-ray crystal structure, atomic resolution model, of some of the heads of 
head and tail viruses. So we'll talk more about head and tail a bit later on. But the head has this nice icosahedral symmetry. In this case, it's a nice T equals 7 icosahedrally symmetric structure. But if you zoom into the atomic details of this structure, it turns out that these capsid proteins that should just be sort of sitting next to each other actually have peptide bonds that form between side chains. And what they do is they form this structure which they call chain mail. So literally, each of these subunits, so here we've got a purple subunit from one of these hexamers that now has a covalent bond with a purple subunit of the next one, the green one symmetrically, and the gray one symmetrically as well. And what that means is that each of these individual proteins is literally linked to the other proteins by a covalent bond. This is a peptide bond that forms between side chains. And give this process they call chain mail. What this does is it makes this capsid protein shell incredibly stable because it's literally linked together. Now, this brings us back to our whole paradox that we talked about at the beginning, right? How the heck can you have this ridiculously stable structure and still release the genome from it? Any ideas? So bacterial viruses have a big problem relative to many of the other ones, and that's the virions have to survive in a pretty nasty environment. And usually the way that those virions deal with the infection process is classically known from bacteriophage T4. The virion actually stays completely outside the cell. There's some mechanism for releasing the genome from the virion on the outside. So you actually see empty virions. This is the Hershey Chase experiment where you have virions that attach to the outside of the cell, the genome comes out, and then the virion itself is just still there, you know, left on the outside of the cell. Um, and so this is true for a lot of these bacterial viruses which have these um, very, very, very stable structures. So, wow, kind of crazy. There's another way of talking about virus structures, and viruses use these, so we've gotten way away from sort of typical quasi-equivalence here. What about that other kind of symmetry that we forgot about because he's concentrating too much on icosahedral? Helical symmetry. So helices are great because each of those individual subunits actually interacts not in a quasi-equivalent way with its other subunits, but an identical way. So this subunit here interacts with that subunit there, just the way this subunit here interacts with that subunit there, et cetera, et cetera, of course, until you get to the end of your structure. There's a equivalent, nice mathematical way of talking about these virions. Um, curiously enough, a couple of guys by the name of Watson and Crick came up with this. I wonder who they're all about. Um, know something about helices. But <clears throat> This has to do with the number of subunits per turn relative to the displacement along the helix. Um, and so the, the pitch it will give you basically the equivalent of the T number for your icosahedra. Of course, it doesn't tell you how long the virus particle is because that's going to depend. Turns out that many of these helical structures, not surprisingly, are also associated with the helical nucleic acid that they're associated with. It ends up being just as long as the nucleic acid that they're binding to. In the case of tobacco mosaic virus, the very first virus to be characterized as such, the small filterable disease causing agent, um, has a 6.4 kilo, uh, actually this kilo base, get rid of that P because it's not a base pair, single stranded, um, RNA genome. Um, and three nucleotides per protein subunit. And so you can literally take 6.4 thousand, divide by three, that gives you the number. Now, this is not true for all of these helical structures, but very often it's going to be one of these capsid protein subunits per some subunit of nucleotides um, in that particular structure. 
So that's a helical formation. We've talked about icosahedra. Many bacterial viruses actually have a combination of the two. This is actually one of the largest known bacterial viruses, um, phi, phi KZ, phage phi KZ. Um, 145 angstroms across here at the top. No, I'm not going to ask you to get the triangulation number here, but it's a regular iconosidally symmetric structure. But it has this beautiful helical <coughs> tail structure, and one of the vertices of your iconosahedron is clearly very different than the other vertices of your iconosahedrally symmetric structure. And that's where your DNA gets released. In this case, it gets released through this tail structure and the tail plate um, down here at the bottom. This is a high resolution structure also from cryo-electron microscopy, um, putting all of this structure together. This tail contracts, it actually squishes together, excuse me, um, and in that process does literally make a hole through the membrane. So I talked a little bit about syringes or drills. That's exactly what this does comes down, binds, and then compresses, and that compression process makes a hole in the membrane of the bacterium. Yes? Is this combination of structures, is this typical when you have a phage or a virus of something that has a cell wall, something that needs to be forcibly kind of... So yeah, so the, the question here is basically, well, why never ask why questions in biology? Um, but is it typical for kind of situations where you do have something that's sort of really tough outside and trying to get onto the inside? And so for bacteria, it does seem to be the case. Very often you'll have these head and tail-like structures. Um, turns out that for some even tougher things to get into, like plants, even something like this isn't any good, and we'll talk about how that happens later on. Um, but yes, this is very common in terms of the bacterial viruses. We'll talk about some exceptions. There definitely are some exceptions, but um, for the most part, these bacterial viruses have some kind of variation of this particular structure. So everyone who was looking ahead when I bounced ahead, you saw what's happening next. So we'll have another quicker question. <clears throat> Which of the following has the most similar capsid subunit subunit interactions? Helical, pseudo T equals three icosahedral capsid, and SV40 like icosahedral capsid. A T equals 25 icosahedral capsid, a pseudo T equals 169 icosahedral capsid. Man, feel free to talk about this. <laughs> How can I force you to talk to each other? <laughs> Ten, five. Okay, what do people think? Oh, I guess you probably didn't see the results last time, didn't I? Didn't move them over, did I? Yeah. So la the the last one was I think about ninety some percent um, that had it correct. So I heard people muttering up here they didn't like my question, um, weren't <laughs> clear about what I meant by similar capsid subunit subunit interactions. So um, capsimer is another way of talking about it, the individual capsid subunits. But the whole idea that I was trying to get across here is that quasi-equivalence is only quasi-equivalent, not equivalent. So um, it really is the helical structure which I was looking for. Yeah? I just a comment. Like, I wasn't muttering. I was like, I was telling you. Oh. <laughs> oh, which does uh, remind me, for those of you who weren't lucky enough to have me last term for molecular biology, uh, 
if there are any questions like this on an exam, you know, raise your hand and say, you know, hey, Dr. Stedman, stop talking to Ian, and you know, come and um, answer this question. If there's something which is not clear, and I will do my best to try and make sure that it's a, a clearer explanation. Ah, because each of the each of the capsid subunits, when you go together, each of those is going to have an absolutely equivalent interaction with all the other ones around it. Whereas if you have any kind of icosahedron that's not a t equals one, if I had t equals one up here, then all bets are off. Uh, but anytime it's a t equals three, then you've got hexameric interactions and pentameric interactions. So those are going to be slightly different relative to each other. Anything above a t equals 1 is going to have these different interactions with each other. Okay, yes? Happy now? Not happy now? Relatively speaking. Okay, so let's talk about stuff that we know a lot less about now. Um, having to do with how you get genomes into these capsids and then also how you get them back out um, a little bit later on. So <clears throat> one way to do genome packaging is to actually make the capsid around your genome. <clears throat> and <coughs> this makes sense for a lot of viruses that are going to form inside eukaryotic cells, um, particularly if you've got enveloped viruses. Very often, this is going to be your genome gets packaged as the capsid is being made. Some cases, it's really clear, again, literally from the high-resolution crystal structures, that there's a positively charged part of your capsid protein that, not surprisingly, interacts with a negatively charged nucleic acid. This is going to be a nonspecific interaction, but nonetheless going to be something which is going to allow packaging and particularly the important thing here is you've got your capsid protein on the outside and your genome on the inside, um, just relative to where that particular patch happens to be on your capsid protein. A few viruses use a so-called packaging sequence, and we'll talk about this when we talk about HIV-1 many, many weeks in the future, um, a specific sequence that some of those capsid proteins actually literally are going to interact with. And that specific sequence is then required for getting the formation of the capsid around each of your, <coughs> your virions. Um, a groove, I didn't talk about this too much, but um, when we look at the tobacco mosaic virus, it turns out that each of those capsid protein subunits has a little groove in the structure that the nucleic acid actually fits literally into. Uh, often, for the bacterial viruses, these, again, particularly because these very stable virions, the virion is made by itself, and then the genome gets stuffed into it. Um, and we'll talk about some of that stuffing process um, a little bit later on. Many times in the virion, and again, true for these bacterial viruses, you have some proteins that are involved in that genome packaging per se, and that's in this case, what they call the, the core proteins. In the case of bacteriophage T4, there's actually a protein right up here at the top, which pumps the DNA into the capsid protein structure, and then the tail gets put on um, after that. In some cases, you actually have the nucleic acid associated with so-called scaffolding proteins, and we'll talk more about scaffolding proteins when we talk about assembly in just a second here. But scaffolding proteins we talked about before, this what's present on the outside or sometimes actually on the inside of a capsid, helping form all of it together, and then those proteins are lost. They're actually not part of the final structure, not part of the final <coughs> virion. In some cases, those scaffolding proteins will also associate with the nucleic acids. Yeah? The packaging sequence, is it fair to kind of call that like a, almost a genomic like scaffolding sequence? Like it's just, all it's doing is attracting the correct proteins, it's not really coding for Something, or is it coding for the I was, I was Yeah, so um, sometimes this, so a specific protein, a packaging signal that's present, that's going to be in your nucleic acid. So the packaging signal is in that nucleic acid. It's going to be having a specific protein nucleic acid interaction, like all those 
protein nucleic acid things that we talked about last term. Uh, they are very specific interaction there. And that then, but usually that's only going to be a part of your final capsid protein. Or you can also have the scaffolding proteins that will bind to some of those sequences and bring them into the structure as it's being put together. You can also have those interactions. So the last couple of things in terms of putting virus structures together, we spent a lot of time talking about these naked viruses or the <clears throat> protein capsids. A lot of viruses, particularly those that infect us and make us sick, are enveloped viruses. Where do those envelopes come from? Um, all different kinds of host lipids. You can have lipids that are nuclear lipids that end up being part of your virion. You can have endoplasmic reticulum lipids that are part of your final virion. You can have cytoplasmic membrane lipids that are part of your final virion. Some mixture of those different kinds of things. Almost always these enveloped viruses, again, that have a lipid layer on the outside, have specific viral proteins that are in that piece of membrane. And those are usually glycosylated, if you're thinking about the animal infecting viruses, and are not surprisingly present on the outside of that membrane. And so this is just an example here. Here's their viral membrane with a viral envelope protein put through it, very often decorated with sugars, which are these little purple Y structures here. Um, it's also known as the ectodomain, so the exterior part of your virus envelope protein. Usually have some kind of anchor, which holds it in the membrane, and then a smaller part, which is present on the inside of your virion here. How do you make these? It's through what's called the budding process, and I talked about this right at the beginning. Budding is very much a viral process. It's going through the membrane and picking up this host lipid, but with these viral proteins that are present in that specific part of the host lipid. And how you get your genome, either an already encapsidated genome in some viruses or just the genome itself associated with the specific lipid which has those specific viral proteins is a really interesting and open question for a lot of different viruses. In some cases, you have what's called a matrix protein. This matrix protein is like sort of a bridge between those membrane proteins and the nucleic acid containing proteins, either directly or indirectly. We'll talk a lot more about matrix proteins in individual viruses. When we talk about those, this assembly process in some cases literally is going to happen at the membrane. This is the case for HIV, for influenza, et cetera. So you actually only get virions that are made right at the actual membrane while these are being produced. Some cases to get that nucleic acid associated part of your virion to the membrane, extra lipids will be added to those individual proteins. And again, we'll talk about this when we talk about HIV a little bit later on. Finish up talking about more disassembly rather than the assembly process. We talked about virions being metastable, so outside stable, inside falling apart. One way that this is done is through proteolysis. We'll see proteolysis come up again and again and again. Proteolysis seems to be the very last step very often in putting virus particles together. For polio, um, it's the capsid protein that's actually put together through proteolysis of this individual VP1, 2, and 3 coming together. Influenza and HIV-1 have these so-called fusion proteins that are only made through the proteolysis process. Actually, one of the best HIV-1 drugs is, in fact, a protease inhibitor, for, not just for this purpose, but for other purposes as well. Um, and then Reovirus actually has a specific blocking protein that needs to be get broken down in order for that virion to actually be infectious. Bacteriophages, talked about this a whole bunch now. Almost always, this is not a disassembly process. It's just a release of the genome. You don't have to disassemble the virion at all. Plant viruses we talked about really briefly. That's actually one of the images on my title slide. 
a change in structure. There's actually a change in the structure of the virion which allows the genome to be released. So we'll talk more about virus taxonomy. Why did I bring all my stuff with me today? <laughs> Next time, if you're interested in looking at some of these icosahedral structures, um, I've got them up here. And otherwise, I'll see you on Wednesday.